All right. Um, can we move on to chapter three of the textbook? Um, on chapter three of the textbook, they look at credit risk management. And under this section, they say, elimination of credit risk is impossible as long as credit forms an integral part of the economy. So the organization should manage credit risk in a manner, in such a manner that it does not spiral out of control. So in section 3.1, they look at strategic position of credit risk management. And here on the last sentence of that section, they say, of the paragraph, they say, generally, the following types of uh, risks are common to most businesses. Uh, operational risk, which is arising from day-to-day -day operations. Market risk crop up from business environment in which the firm operates. Legal risk is the result uh, is the result of the various legally binding agreements entered into by the firm, or because of contravention of the laws of the land. Computer or system uh, system risk arise from the information technology used and associated uh, system procedures. Reputation risk emerge from factors that would lower the goodwill and reputation of the business in the eyes of the public, which impacts business prospects. And liquidity risks uh, and um, improper balance structure are among several financial risks faced by the business entity as well. Then, so, when you look at a normal non-financial organization, the credit risk is dependent on the percentage of sales on credit. Because if you look at the non-financial organization, we're basically saying for a non-financial organization, there's when you look at their sales revenue, the sales revenue can be split into two. Some of the sales can be on cash, and some of the sales are going to be on credit risk. So for a non-financial organization, the credit risk is the risk that is emanating from this sales revenue, from the sales revenue that is coming from what? From the credit risk. So which means the higher the percentage of the sales which are going to be emanating from what? From the credit sales, the higher the what? The credit risk faced by the organization as well. So the higher the percentage of sales which are going to be on credit, the higher the credit risk for a non-financial organization. Now, looking at this, on section uh, 3.2, uh, 3 we look at credit risk management context. We don't really need to worry much about it. Then on section 3.3, they look at credit risk management objectives. And on line number two, they say, a financial intermediary takes credit risk to earn financial income in the form of interest income or otherwise. So a non-financial entity takes it to enhance its revenue base. So when you look at credit risk, we're saying for a non-financial entity, they take credit risk because they want to be able to increase what? The sales revenue. For a financial entity, this is where we look at the accounting equation. We say your assets equal equity plus liability. So the credit risk is basically emanating from these credit assets that they're investing in as well. So this is basically where we look at the difference between the credit risk faced by a non-financial entity and a financial entity. So when you look at the credit risk finance faced by a non-financial entity and a financial entity. So the difference there is basically where the risk, the credit risk is basically going to be emanating from. For a non-financial entity, this is where the credit risk is coming from us being able to increase our sales. Because remember, for a non-financial entity, like for example, if a company is manufacturing a particular product, we know that if company A and company B manufactures the same product, but company A is insisting that all our sales are going to be on cash on basis only, and company B is now flexible to say, we can allow you to buy on cash or on credit. You will see that more customers are going to be buying what from company B because it's good, what? Not everyone has the cash amount that is needed, what? To buy the goods and services as well. So because of this, 
we know that companies offer credit to non-financial entities offer credit mainly because they want to be able to boost their sales revenues. And financial entities, they offer credit because they want to be able to generate income or returns from what interest and on their credit assets. So with that in mind, we look at the overall major objectives of credit risk, uh, risk management would include the following, maximizing benefits from potential credit opportunities, pricing credit risk adequately. Remember when you look at credit risk, uh, pricing credit risk adequately, this is where we're saying that we need to make sure that we uh, acknowledge all the potential risk premium so that the higher the risk premium, the higher the interest that's going to be charged. So the interest charge is basically the price of credit. Then minimizing bad loans, adherence to credit policies, and maintenance of a reliable database. Because you need a reliable database because this will give you information to say historically, what was the uh, performance of your customers historically so that you use that information to now assess on your decision to say, should we give them more credit or not as well? So you need what? A reliable database. On, unit, on session 3.4, we look at the credit risk management structure. And on line number three, they say, okay, let's start from the beginning. They say, in order to ensure the attainment of credit objectives, various strategies and steps have to be implemented, which requires a structure with specific functions. Structure should be adapted to the strategies which emanate from the objectives. For instance, while a tight credit risk policy may result in centralization of approved powers, a lenient attitude towards risk in order to garner higher market share may require the strategy of what? Decentralization of what? Of such powers. Because if you're looking at centralization and decentralization, this is where you're saying, for example, when it comes to a centralized system, this is where if a company has branches, Let's say it's got a branch in Joburg, it's got a branch in Pretoria, it's got a branch in Cape Town, and the whole head office, let's say it's in Devon as well. It basically means that these different branches, they just capture the customer information, and then they send that information to the head office. Then the head office, the one that's going to decide now, look at these applications individually and say, are we offering credit or are we not offering credit? But when you're having a decentralized system, this is where the different... Um, parties in the, within or decision, decision makers within the branches can be able to, what, to grant or not to grant what the credit to the customers as well. So generally with the centralized system, the information flow is slow, so which means that you have a situation where the risk taking is going to be, uh, the, 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 the decision making is going to be slow as well. But with the, when a company wants to achieve a higher market share, this is where they can now pursue a decentralized system because it means that uh, decision making is going to be quicker and at the same time they're going to be able to what to get more customers so all these system systems have their own advantages and disadvantages as well can we move on to 3.5 on session 3.5 we look at the credit risk culture and on the second paragraph they say Credit culture is a set of values and beliefs shared by people in credit risk management. It encompasses the tangible written policies and procedures and the intangibles such as traditions, philosophies, and informal standards. So to understand this better on paragraph number three, on the last sentence of that page or page, uh, page number 29, they say, this must be corroborated in all meetings and words actions and communication. So that's basically the credit risk culture. So here they say, a well understood credit risk culture will enable the decision make takers and employees in credit risk management to take effective and intelligent risk decisions, ensuring that the achievement of the credit risk management, uh, ensuring what? The achievement of the credit risk management objectives. 
So which means we want to ensure that at the end of the day, we have, if we have a good credit risk culture, it means whoever is going to be offering credit to the customers, they are going to be, uh, uh, they know all the information that they need for them to be able to make an informed decision to stay within the uh, desired risk appetite of the overall organization as well. So on the next paragraph, on line number two, they say, the recent 2008 credit crisis has highlighted the importance of credit culture the lack of which led to deficiencies and flaws in credit procedures and decisions. Mainly because if you compare the US banks and the South African banks as well, we saw that there was a lot of deregulation that was being pursued on the US banks perspective. So which basically means that they, uh, you have a situation where the participants were giving out uh, the suppliers of credit they were offering this particular credit even to customers who didn't qualify for the credit with the, with the perception that there's no way the system is going to fail. One or the other, the government was to bail them out as well. So that's basically, that was the culture of that you, when you look at the way the employees were operating, the culture was basically that they were pursuing profits and uh, they were prepared to take on risk in pursuit of profits. And they knew that one or the other, the institutions or the financial institutions were too big to fail. And with that particular culture, it basically meant that they, uh, there, was, there was too much risk that was being taken. And uh, knowing very well that one or the other, the government will still step in and bail them out. And if you look at the, the same period as well, before the uh, financial crisis, this is where we had the Credit Act, where there was uh, the banks you had to follow the Credit Act, Act, where they need to make sure that what whoever was being given credit was, uh, was qualifying for the credit. So that's why you see that if you look at the, the impact of the recession in 2008 on South Africa and other comparable countries like the US as well, South Africa was more cushioned better than what than the effect that you had when you look at uh, the US perspective as well. Are there any questions from section 3.5 before we move on to the next section? Any questions? Moving on to section 3.6, they look at the risk up, uh, the credit risk appetite. Remember we said generally, you want to make sure that the uh, uh, credit risk culture of the organization is where we see that the employees and decision makers are staying within the credit uh, appetite of the organization. So you don't want a situation where you have a, you are offering credit to customers who are over and above the desirable credit limit of the organization. So when you look at the credit risk appetite, they say credit risk appetite must be established as a strong foundation, which will prescribe the type, amount, nature, and extent of credit risk that an organization is willing to underwrite. So usually a credit risk appetite statement is drawn up by prescribing the following, the first one being the target market. And here they say, understanding the target market in which the credit would be offered is essential for a number of reasons. The first one being, it ensures strat strategies and products are developed in accordance with the market. And two, the mar market criteria ensures that no opportunities are missed in the identified target markets and conversely, they will screen out the market segments where the organization is no risk appetite. So this is where you see, for example, uh, where we now we saw that just after the recession, there was a lot, there was a huge rise in um, in uh, uh, unsecured lending. When you look at uh, the smaller banks that were offering unsecured lending, now we look at uh, short-term lenders like Capfin or African Bank. What? offering short-term lending as well. And that's when you saw that um, over time, the, even the bigger banks that way, uh, that was uh, shunning the smaller segment of the market where they were not giving out that unsecured lending to the um, smaller segment of the market or the lower income earners of the market. They were now pushing more of that product as well. Although they were now having the minimum requirements, like for example, if we look at just after the recession, there was a bigger push in the um, low income areas where the banks were giving out 
unsecured lending as well. Like, although they were giving out conditions, like for example, give us your uh, pay slip and also you must be earning a minimum of, of I think it was about 8,000 or something like that. So it's basically where they're saying that you need to make sure that you are able to identify the target market and you have the high right risk appetite with the target market and in finding ways of mitigating the risk of the target market, you can now be able to actually what? increase your market share as well. The second one is minimum credit standards. And here they say credit risk appetite will prescribe the minimum acceptable standards of the credit risk required while building the business. So you need to be able to prescribe the minimum uh, credit standards uh, of the risk required what when building the business. So it seems that you need to be able to have the minimum standards to say for us to give what credit to this particular customer, what are the minimum requirements that they need to be able to meet for us for them to uh, qualify for the credit. The, uh, the third one is sectors. And here they say risk appetite would require the study of major sectors to identify those which are desirable. And here they say, depending upon the sector's attractiveness, the risk appetite would vary as follows. No appetite, if so, if there's no appetite, it means you need to reduce, which is there. This is where you find what? The least attractive sector. Grow, this is where you've identified the factor that you are having a good potential for you to be able to give out credit to. And the selective growth, this is where you look at the sectors that hold reasonable potential. So which means that you are going to be looking at the uh, sectors to say, how are we going to ensure that we have, um, uh, we can potentially what? Give out credit to these particular uh, sectors as well, so that we're able to actually what? Uh, grow our, uh, our market segment as well. The next one is products offered. And here they say, risk appetite would also detail the type of credit products to be developed in line with the risk appetite. While pricing the product, it would be ensured that, that the risk is adequately priced in as well. So we need that when you look at the risk appetite as well, you need to also select to see exactly. So what are the products that are going to be offering based on our risk appetite? So are there any questions when it comes to the analysis of the uh, risk appetite and exactly what needs to be taken into account when you look at the risk appetite? Any questions? On session 3.7, we look at credit risk management in non-financial firms. So remember, when you look at non-financial firms, this is where we say these are firms that are basically not necessarily in the financial uh, uh, industry. So which means the credit risk appetite is where they're selling their goods and service or services or not on credit basis because they want to improve that their sales revenue as well. Because if they're able to improve their sales revenue, it means they're also going to be able to improve what their profitability as well. So based on that. They say, in the case of manufacturing firm or trading firm, extension of credit is essential for sales promotion. The resulting receivables or debtors portfolio evidences the credit risk undertaken by the firm. Usually, they finance the customer's purchases on an unsecured basis for periods ranging from one month to six months. Extended credit running in two years is not uncommon with the support of bank guarantees or letters of credit. So this is where like, for example, they sell you a phone and they say you paid off over, uh, over two years or over three years. So it's basically where you're basically offering uh, your goods or not on, on credit. So if you skip the next paragraph, they say the goal of the analyst in non-financial firms is to protect the investment in receivables. Because remember, when you sell your goods on credit, it means that you're going to be having debtors. So how do we now ensure that these debtors are able what, to meet their obligations? So here they say, uh, if you go to the uh, fourth paragraph under that section, they say on line number two, an increase or reduction in the amount invested in receivables will usually have a significant impact on the company's cash flows and 
on the company's cash cycle, which is the time required to convert goods into cash from the date of the company that the company pays the cost of acquisition of the goods to the date of the receipt of the, uh, from what associated sales as well. So when you look at the cash cycle, what they're discussing here when they talk about the cash cycle, this is what we also refer to as the cash conversion cycle. We're going to discuss it in detail later on in the chapters, where we say the cash conversion cycle is given as your average age of inventory plus your average collection period minus your average payment period. So your cash conversion cycle is your average age of inventory plus your average collection period minus average payment period. So we're basically saying, how long are we taking as an organization from the time we purchase these goods on credit, we take, purchase these goods, uh, purchase the, the inputs on credit, like for example, we buy inventory, we process them into a finished goods and we sell them. That's your average age of inventory. Then after we sell these goods, we can sell them on cash or we can sell them on, on credit. And if you sell them on credit, how long are we taking before we receive money from our customers? Then from there, now that we've bought these goods on credit, how long are we taking before we pay our suppliers? So ideally, we're basically saying that the aim is to make sure that the cash conversion cycle is as, as, as low as possible. Because the lower the cash conversion cycle, the more you know that you're able to, to go through this cycle as many times as possible. The more you go through this cycle as many times as possible, the more money you're making as a business. So which means to lower this cash conversion cycle, we are trying to lower the average age of inventory because you don't be having inventory that is stuck within the business. Because if the inventory is stuck within the business, it's basically an opportunity cost to you because you would have sold this business and made more money. And you want your customers to pay you as soon as possible. And ideally, you want to delay paying your suppliers as much as possible, as long as you don't affect your credit relationship with your suppliers. So which means if your supplier say, pay us in 30 days time, there's no point in you paying on day zero. Ideally, you want to pay on day 30. It's within the credit term, but at the same time, you're able to lower your cash conversion cycle. You're able to manage your cash because remember they say cash is the lifeblood of every business. So which means your credit risk management is now looking at this, this element, average collection period, because this is where the credit is coming from. So the higher the average collection period, the higher the credit risk you're facing. Because the longer your data take to settle the accounts, the higher the probability that they're going to end up defaulting on their obligations. So the longer the data take to settle the account, the higher the probability that they're going to end up defaulting on their obligations. So that's why we see that the average collection period you want to be as low as possible because the lower the average collection period, the lower the credit risk. Are we on the same page? So which means non-financial firms, they are now having to play between the dilemma where they say, we want to be offering credit to our customers, but we don't want, to, well, we don't want them to pay after a longer period of time. Because if they pay after a longer period of time, they might end up defaulting on the obligations. But at the same time, we don't want to be too strict with our customers and ask them to pay on cash. Because if we ask them to pay on cash, very few of our customers are going to be able to pay that on cash, which means our sales revenue goes down. But to improve our sales revenue, we're trying to offer credit, but at the same time, we have to do a balancing act when it comes to the average collection period, because the longer the customers take to pay their accounts, the higher the credit risk as well. Any questions? Moving on to section 3.8. So moving on to section 
Section 3.8, they look at the credit risk management in financial intermediaries. So when you look at the credit risk management in financial intermediaries, this is basically what we're looking at. So we're looking at this relationship here. We'll be saying that the financial assets are the ones that are going to be what? Income generating for them. So how do we manage the, this credit risk emanating from the what? From the financial assets, from the credit assets. So which means based on that, they're saying, they look at the stages of credit risk management in financial intermediaries. And yet they say, the steps usually followed by a financial intermediary are listed below. The first one, they say, they look at the nature and purpose of the credit. And yet they say, the purpose should be acceptable to the lender. That is, it must be legal, non-speculative, and in accordance with the lender's priorities. So which means you don't want a situation where you are giving out credit to a particular inter enterprise where they end up using that money to pay salaries or they end up using that money to uh, to meet whatever uh, expense that is not necessarily what do to do with what income generation. That's why you see that uh, if you look at the um, in the news over the past week, they were talking about Daniel asking for billions in bailout from the um, from the government. And uh, one of the conditions that was being stated there was that they cannot use this money to pay salaries, mainly because if they use the money to pay salaries, it basically means that it's not the supply of credit there is basically going to be losing out on their money because that money is not necessarily what being used to make more money for the enterprise. Next, we look at the type of credit facility. And on line number five, they say the loans can be short term or long term. Another major subset of credit facilities extended by the banks are known as non funded lines, which includes letters of credit and guarantees where no funds are provided. But they are giving you a guarantee to say at some point in the future, when you want the money, we're guaranteeing you that what we're going to be giving you uh, the money. So because of that guarantee, it means that you are now going to be having what uh, you are going to be uh, paying a particular commission as well. You are going to be paying a commission, uh, a commitment fee, which uh, where you are, when you pay the commitment fee is basically going to be a sort of income for the uh, um, for the enterprise as well. So here they say a revolving line of credit, working capital loan, term loan, lease financing, and higher uh, higher purchase or bill check or, or bill or check discounting and similar facilities are offered by banks. And another type would be the use of what? Of credit cards as well. So these are the different types of facilities which are also offered by the banks as what? Lines of credit as well. The next one, they look at the capacity to borrow. And yet they say, the lenders ought to check the legal status of the person who obtains the credit. Do they qualify to be able to, or do, are they legally able to sign uh, for the on the contract, or are there any other issues? So which means that we need to check to see exactly what is the capacity to borrow of that particular uh, of that particular uh, obliga as well. The next one is security. Where the security is needed for a credit decision depends upon the level of credit worthiness. That's why we say that. When you look at companies which are triple A rated, in most cases, they don't require to provide, they are not required what? to provide a security as well. So it will depend on the type of what transaction as well. We're going to be looking at that uh, in chapter 22 and 23 as well. We're going to be looking at it in detail when it comes to security. The next one, they, they look at analyze borrower's financial status. The analysis of the financial position of the borrower is one of the essential preludes of the granting of credit. So the fundamental question is in the financial analysis is the ability of the business to generate adequate cash flows from operations, what? To meet their commitments. So various measures to gauge solvency, liquidity, efficiency, and repayment capacity are among others that have been developed, what? To study financial parameters relevant to the 
lender's point of view. And we're going to be looking at this in detail in chapter eight, where we look at financial resources mainly. Then we look at forecasting the repayment capacity. And here they say, the lender should have reasonable assurances about the ability of the borrower to meet their commitments when they fall due in the future. So here they say, the shorter the duration of the loan, the more predictable the remain, repayment ability. That is why the analysis of project finance and long-term loans is different from techniques followed by for assessing the repayment ability of short-term loans as well. Because with short-term loans, there's a, a higher chance that the financial situation of the uh, obliga might not change. But now when it comes to long-term loans, we don't know whether the company is going to be in existence five years from now, 15 years from now as well. So because of this, it makes it very more, a bit more difficult you know not forecasting the repayment capacity of the obliga. The next one looks at profitability. And here they say, the commercial lender incurs costs in making credit available to customers. So salaries of employees involved in, appra in appraising, granting and monitoring the credit, rent and other overheads should be covered, recovered from the return generated from that credit besides the cost of the funds as well. So usually viewed as the interest paid on deposits. So when you look at your financial obligation, we're basically saying, we're basically saying, On the liability side, remember we said on the liability side, we also have depositors as well. So whatever interest we're paying on the, to the depositors, whatever return we're going to be generated from the financial assets today, it must be more than what we're paying is interest to the, to the depositors. And it also must also filter in those other operating expenses as well. So that is what overall there's going to be something left to the owners of the business as well. So that's basically what they're trying to highlight. So here yeah, the thing. On the next point, they say structure the credit facility, including conditions and covenants. And on line number three, they say credit facility agreements specify mutual expectations of the borrower and the lender and respective duties and obligations. So violations of conditions is tantamount to default, and the lender can repossess the credit facility and other claims or start legal proceedings to for repossession depending upon the term of the terms of agreement so which means when you're now looking at the conditions and covenants as well whether you have paid your interest for that period if you violate the conditions and covenants it that is considered to be what a default as well which means that the lender can actually uh, take what proce uh, proceeding to ensure that they're able to protect their interests as well then they look at this last step where they say constant monitoring. And then they say the credit facilities should be monitored closely through various steps, including risk limits, capital allocation, and periodical reports on the borrower sector and the economy as well. So are there any questions? Are there any questions? Any questions so far? On section 3.8.2, we look at the credit risk management process. So we look at the credit risk management process. And the other thing, the credit risk management process tends to be elaborate so as to tackle the challenges associated with the credit risk. So a strict policy framework is maintained to ensure that the credit risk culture is enforced throughout the organization. So the usual methodology is as follows, finalize, the overall credit risk appetite, establish objectives and strategy where you decide on the reward and risk pattern, inclusive of provisioning, roll out the credit risk infrastructure to facilitate measurement and ownership of the credit risk. And nowadays, IT systems are also play a key role in actually doing the simulation as well. Then you need to identify the, the right people and ensuring proper communication behavior and behavior and incentivization as well. Then you need to implement appropriate credit risk models and to ensure that there is no 
over reliance on credit risk models, which means that there is need for uh, the model to be used, but at the same time, you also need the human intervention to actually what make the final decision as well. So here they say a financial intermediary is in the business of risk underwriting. Hence, none of the financial intermediaries can be termed as risk averse. So the primary goal of the credit risk management process is to ensure that the right people understand the right risks, isolating unacceptable risks and identifying acceptable risks. Thereafter, the appropriate risk mitigants must be identified and implemented. And when you look at the risk mitigants, we're going to be looking at it in chapter, I think it's chapter one, uh, 21. Are there any questions? Are there any questions on what we've done in chapter three? Any questions? So please take note of this because this is where they can potentially bring in theory questions as well. So as the homework, can you please look at question three of chapter three? So as a homework, can you please look at question three of chapter three? So let's end here today. In the next class, we are going to be looking at the, this part two of the textbook, which looks at the firm or obliga credit risk. So we're going to be looking at part two of the textbook, which looks at the firm or obliga credit risk. Then from there in part three, we're going to be looking at what? Portfolio credit risk as well. So we're going to be, it's gonna be breaking down into where we now look at the different risks that are going to be identified. Uh, and we're going to be looking to see that they are going to be related to each other. We say we have business risk and financial risk. So we're going to first look at business risk where we look at uh, the EIF type of risk, uh, e, uh, external, industry, internal, and uh, uh, type of risks. Then uh, in chapter, then after that, in chapter eight, we're going to be looking at what? Financial risk as well, which makes up the whole EIIF risk. We're going to be looking, seeing them, the, that acronym, quite a lot as well in the next coming chapters. Are there any questions on what we've done so far? Any questions? Hi, uh, so uh, I've got a question, not yes. only related to the content. I wanted to know, like, uh, how can I get a copy of the textbooks we were using just now? All right, usually um, the textbooks are available once you're registered or you take the, uh, the trial package. But what I would do is, the, uh, I'll try to share the textbooks on the WhatsApp groups. I'll, I'll share the textbook on the WhatsApp groups because for RSK 404 and 05, you see that it's just one, material that you need, which is basically the textbook. So I'll share the textbooks on the different WhatsApp groups as well. I'll make sure that after today's class, I'll share the textbooks on the different WhatsApp groups. What is a bit more difficult to share it would be the articles because it's different. Yeah, it's quite a lot of articles. It's difficult to break them down as well. But the textbooks for RSK 404 and 05, I'll make sure that I share them on the WhatsApp groups. Cool, thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, enjoy the rest of your day. Please try as much as possible to access the videos for where we are going to be going through chapters four and chapter five as well. Try to look at them in advance because if you're able to read through in advance, it basically means that when you attend the classes, if there's something that you don't understand, you'll be having a list of things that you don't understand and I'll be able to explain to you in detail so that you're able to understand better as well. So please try as much as possible to read through the material in advance. The videos are there from last year, you're able to access them as well. So please try as much as possible
to go through the material in advance so that it's easier for me to explain and understand, know exactly where you're getting lost. Because it's different from where we had contact classes. Because when you had contact classes, you can judge by people's faces. You can see that mm, people are still lost here or not lost there. But now that we're having online classes, it's difficult to judge because I can't see people's faces. So because of that, please try as much as possible to go through the material in advance so that when you go through the question, the material in the, in the textbook, you are able to ask questions. The more questions you're able to ask, the more I'm able to explain in detail. And the more I'm able to explain in detail, the more you're able to understand the applicability of these concepts as well. So please try as much as possible to go through the material in advance. Uh, Rhinos, um, can mm -hmm. I just ask, uh, where can we access these videos? Because I, I checked on YouTube, there was only two available. Uh, uh, what to, once you are registered, you will be able to access these videos. So just make sure that you are registered as well. Because even if you register on the uh, for the trial version as well, there there's limitations on exactly what material we give. But if you're fully registered, you will be able to access these videos as well in advance for the coming study units as well. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? All right, enjoy the rest of the weekend.